May I request somebody to close the door? May I request the others who are standing behind you to take their seats, please? Colleagues, Amita, would you kindly take your seat, please? And close the door. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the final session of this fantastic conference. Uh, we had a very productive one and a half day, and now we are coming to the final session. I have been asked to chair the session. It's a unique privilege for me uh, to preside over this session, as we have very five very erudite, insightful presentation coming up. Uh, I have been in at least 3,522 sessions after lunch. I don't remember any of them because I dozed off most of the cases. And I, but I assure you, this won't be the case this time, because we have very stimulating you know, speakers today. Uh, we have, um, let me invite the colleagues up here on the podium, because there is enough people already in the audience, so they, they won't, we won't feel empty room. Uh, so I have here, the first speaker is David Carmen and uh, Sami Yagadesin. I think they will be speaking virtually. I hope and pray that the connection works properly. And then we have Nilima Gulrajani. Nilima, would you can you come to the podium? And then we have Christopher Zurker. Christopher Zurker, would you kindly come to the podium? Or he is also online. Okay, so the fourth is, of course, Rachel Kaleja and Beata Chikok. Please. Come on. Rachel, please. Thank you. And uh, last but not the least, of course, uh, our great organizer, Rachel Jesselquist. Rachel? Andrea, okay, very good. And now I'm going to have some gender balance. Please come. Uh, so uh, Andrea Vaccaro, on behalf of the three authors over here. Uh, colleagues, you, you will see that this session has a broad canvas uh, and is essentially focusing on three major dimensions. One is, of course, on the fragile states. Uh, particularly Mali, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and many others of that sort. And then what is very interesting is that we were going to do a retrospect and try to identify the development narratives which have been there around this issue of aid effectiveness, a couple of papers on that. And finally, empirical evidence uh, of various sorts, uh, different ways of looking at the interrelationship, if not causality, of different variables over here. So. Without much ado, without further words, introduction, let me invite David Carmen, who will be joining us virtually. I, uh, can we bring him on the screen? Yes, we can see you. Would you kindly talk? So we can hear you too. Would you? No, we can't hear you. Yeah, by oh, yeah. The, uh, of the That's system. better. Okay, so thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be back, so to speak. Uh, this is my third or fourth opportunity to present our, our research at a UNU wider organized event on aid effectiveness. Um, I was a, uh, a research uh, visiting scholar at uh, UNU wider a few years ago where we completed our book on uh, exiting the fragility trap where we examined why some states remain stuck in a fragility trap while others safely exit. I'd also like to thank um, the organizers of this, of this event, uh, Rachel and uh, Patricia, for uh, the wonderful uh, program they put together. This is really uh, a good time to organize something like this. And a, a hi to Rachel uh, Kalea, who was a co-author and a former PhD student 
of mine uh, at, at the uh, School of International Affairs where I teach. So on to the topic at hand, aid effectiveness in fragile states, and I guess conflict affected context as well. And what we're going to be doing, I'm speaking on behalf of my co-author, Yagdis and Sammy, or Teddy Sammy, as we like to call him, uh, is cover some of the work that we've done on fragile states. Uh, and what I would like to do We lost you, Professor. Aid effectiveness in the context of states trapped in fragility, briefly speak to the impact of COVID-19 and any implications therein for aid effectiveness. And then finally, try to uh, touch upon uh, the situation in Ukraine and how that is affecting uh, these fragile states around the world. So, I seem to be We lost you again. Great. To review the uh, the research in place that we can draw on to understand aid effectiveness in a, a fragile states context, I think it's useful to look back at what the OECD and the World Bank have produced over the last few years. In 2020, the OECD identified 57 fragile contexts, including 13 extremely fragile contexts. And notice they're using the word, context, the word context as opposed to state, and there's a reason for that. I hope my co-presenters will touch upon it. The World Bank has a projection for 2023 that there will be a 39 countries in a fragile conflict uh, affected situation. And in 2020, they identified a, f a fewer number of fragile states. So this discrepancy, I think, is accounted for in part by how these two organizations measure fragility, but nevertheless, um, there is a concern here that the number of fragile states is increasing over time and is likely to increase uh, over the next year or so. And hopefully we can touch upon why that is the case. If you look at the conflict side of the equation, we can see that uh, there's going to be a significant uptick in the number of uh, events related to violence as recorded by the Uppsala Data Project. Um, this is partly driven by ongoing conflicts around the world, not the least of which would be those in Ethiopia, Yemen, and now more currently Ukraine. On the other hand, poverty is not declining at, at the same pace. In fact, it's on track to increase. Most fragile states will not meet their global tar the, the targets of meeting or uh, eradicating poverty, rather. And by the year 2030, um, poverty will become increasingly uh, focused or concentrated in fragile states. Um, uh, worthwhile pointing out that OEDA official development assistance is the second largest source of external finance for many fragile states, uh, but often the first when examined country by country, outstripped. The policy side, it's worthwhile revisiting 20 years of research on the question of aid effectiveness. And I think we have to start with the Burnside and Dollar um, research showing that basically, as we all know, that Aid effectiveness is conditional on the qualities of policies and institutions. This is a research point reinforced by our own work, but also by Collier and others. Essentially, a good policy environment is going to ensure the likelihood that investments in a uh, fragile state's economy will take hold and improve the country's economic and political and social situ situation over time. Uh, yet, that is not the case for the most fragile states in the world due to what we call poor policy environments. Additionally, uh, questions of volatility and unpredictability have been found to um, impact aid effectiveness. Here we're speaking of the kinds of aid flowing into the country and the volatility or rather the rapid changes in which aid darlings and aid orphans are often uh, uh, allocated aid. And uh, the difficulty here, I guess, is the focus of the aid community on fragile states, with some countries clearly Overrated and some being extremely underrated. And here there are questions regarding aid absorption. And essentially, there's a sort of a threshold where states can no longer really take make good use of the aid that they're receiving. And uh, this problem of absorption is an ongoing issue regarding states that are overrated. Finally, we come to questions regarding 
donor proliferation and fragmentation, and the emergence of new actors, uh, non-DAC donors and so on, private philanthropic foundations and global funds. I'm sure my co-presenters will provide some discussion on that. So moving on, um, our own work in terms of ranking and evaluating uh, aid effectiveness outcomes, we see that there are indeed states that are not responding to aid uh, in, in a sense that they are exiting the fragility trap. Over the period of about 20 years, uh, all documented in our, our books and research output, including various briefs and so on, we find that there are about 10 countries or perhaps more, depending on the given year, that are ranking quite high on a number of scores. Uh, not only the fragility scores is pointed out here. Uh, now, this is not the most recent data we have, but it's useful to at least begin um, to uh, understand the difficulty many states are experiencing. Some of these countries are probably uh, no surprise to you. Others might be, for example, Pakistan uh, is on this list, as is um, Uganda and so on. But many of these countries have been stuck in a fragility trap, which is due in part to this particular issue in which we identify uh, why states are trapped and we track performance over three key measures, legitimacy, capacity, and authority. Here you can see that, well, um, <clears throat> what we're looking at are trend lines over the 20 year period. Capacity has actually improved in what we mean in terms of economic development. So there's some growth related here, although there's been an uptick since, uh, since COVID-19 hit. Uh, but we see that authority, which is essentially the integrity of the state and sovereign control over the state is, a, is a worsening as is uh, legitimacy and overall uh, fragility scores are deteriorating over time amongst these states that we consider to be trapped. So we have to get to the nub of the issue as to why aid is less effective in these countries. And we believe it is a result of a failure to essentially engage countries on the legitimacy problems they face, that is good governance and also institutional effectiveness. Uh, there are a number of reasons why aid is less effective in most uh, difficult uh, and trapped states. And um, I've identified a few of these here, isomorphic mimicry, which uh, really is a situation where states present formally institutions and democratic performance measures pro forma, but are not functioning and in line with what the expectations of the donors have in terms of improvement in these areas over time. So it is a way, uh, as Pritchett has suggested, is hiding uh, the, uh, the realities of informal institutions and ineffective service delivery within these countries. But there are also questions about how we monitor and evaluate improvement over time. And Perhaps I'm sorry to interrupt you. Three more minutes. Okay. Reversals and backsliding have become subtler over time and it's more difficult to monitor. There are rent economies in which the uh, informal sector has a, a vast interest in uh, ensuring that aid is delivered to ungoverned spaces and they act as brokers in which aid is uh, used for personal gain as opposed to improving the situation in these countries. We also have coups in a number of countries being presented as efforts to restore stability, some of which involve US trained officers, but in reality, the good governance is in short supply. And then we have issues related to hybrid states where the strategy is not exit from fragility, but rather control. And then finally, uh, many, many of these countries are not on target to meet their SDG 16 targets goals. And as a result, um, they are less likely to achieve uh, exit from fragility. Now, just very briefly in the time allotted, COVID-19 and the impact, well, I don't need to tell you that the situation was significantly uh, deteriorating over time for many of the fragile states, not, not the least of which would be those countries affected further on by the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, there are a number of scenarios here that have been play playing out in terms of the levels of poverty and increasing poverty over time. Uh, the World Bank predicted that there would be a fallback to 2017 levels with an increase of 40 to 60 million people in ab living in absolute poverty. Uh, there have been a number of in increasing deaths in countries that are affected by COVID-19, but this may be uh, related to measurement problems. This, the numbers may act actually be higher in some countries where they are fragile. Uh, so we can see a discrepancy here where we have 36 deaths per million in Afghanistan and similar numbers for Pakistan, but much lower numbers for Burundi and the DRC. Moving on, 
what else, what else can we take from the COVID-19 impact? It's as if it, we've forgotten that this was a problem just uh, just uh, two years ago. But many countries are affected and have still remain affected by virtue of them having limited act, infrastructure, health infrastructure, and so on. Uh, but there are uh, secondary impacts, including job losses in the formal and informal sector, which disproportionately impact women, uh, reduced economic activity because of people's uh, unwilling uh, un inability to pay taxes, uh, law decline in remittances, and so on, an increase in domestic violence. There is also, by virtue of the weakening of the state, an increase in our group activity around uh, around the world, but in, specifically in the Western Sahel and West Africa. So moving on, my, my last slide, um, we had predicted, uh, the World Bank certainly predicted that the uh, states who were on the periphery of Russia would be directly impacted by, by the uh, Ukraine-Russia war, specifically uh, by virtue of sanctions being placed on, on Russia and its declining economy. As a result, people who work in Russia but remit home to the Central Asian states, for example, would be uh, facing a dual problem of a weakened rule, which would mean their, the money they're sending back is, is, has less value, but also that the, they would be returning to economies that were themselves weak. In fact, we haven't seen that. So back in the, around the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia war, uh, it was estimated that uh, some of the Central Asian states would see it hit on their economy of, Upwards of 10, 15 percent. In fact, uh, some countries have actually seen an increase. This is by uh, virtue of uh, increase uh, in uh, commodity export uh, uh, by some of these countries and price stabilization within the commodity uh, component of their economy, but also because the Russian economy hasn't performed as badly as many predicted. Nevertheless, there is for fragile states an impact on agriculture and food prices, as well as energy and fuel shortages. Looking ahead, the uh, last 10 seconds, to summarize in terms of the Ukraine-Russia war, what we're seeing being played out here is a geopolitical problem in which uh, countries that are caught between the great powers, uh, whether it's China and Russia, uh, Russia and the US, um, are going to be aided in ways that may not be in their interests uh, long term, for example, increasing emphasis on security structures, no, most notably in West Africa, uh, where the U.S. has decided to prioritize some of its investments, uh, but also in the Sahel and so on. And one of the key findings from our own research is in terms of aid effectiveness is that uh, this kind of emphasis on security or the authority component of state building up that authority security structure creates distortions in a way that other areas tend to remain under underfunded, particularly in good governance Thank you. And, service and so on. So ultimately, um, there's no body of evidence showing military aid is, is as effective in strengthening fragile states. And so we have a situation where I think the donor community think, needs to think very strongly about whether the idea of focusing on security structures is a long-term solution for these fragile states. Thank you very much. Colleagues, that was Professor David Carmen from the Carlton University. Otto, please big, give a big hand to him. And doing this heroic in, heroic intervention notwithstanding the technical glitches uh, if you uh, if you have noted that he has focused on the fragile state and if you may have noted that the definition of the fragile state still remain contested between the world bank and the oecd he has mentioned about the all the standard things in the sense that it is it has the issues uh, relating to predictability and also uh, fragmentation and absorptive capacity. One of the fundamental points had been that it is the capa it is the legitimacy issue which is more important than the capacity in these countries. And he went on to describe that the the prospect looks very dim, and uh, not only from the violence perspective but also from SDG implementation. My, Towards the end, he brings up the COVID-19 and the Ukraine-Russian war issue, and and it shows that the the interesting uh, the it, they are being affected equally almost from many dimensions as the rest of the world, but more importantly, uh, the prospect of increased military violence or the armed violence is increasing, and the military aid is not going to really help uh, the development perspective in this case. So I think that was an interesting 
paper. And you may have noted, along with the fragile state definition, thank you very much, Christine, for the water. I need that. And, and uh, so the, he introduces the term trapped state. So that's another interesting point over there. So let's move on. Let's, uh, the, the, another good, uh, interesting presentation coming up from Dr. Nilima Gulrajani. Uh, she is a, research, a senior research fellow at ODI London, uh, also located in uh, Canada. And uh, Nilima is going to talk about making, she will help us to make sense out of multiple development narratives mm, regarding global effectiveness. Nilima. Thank you, Deb, and thank you, colleagues. Do give me a three minute warning as well, that would be helpful. Um, thank you to the organizers and the funders um, of this conference. Do I need two mics? Or? Two mics are good? Okay. Um, for giving me the opportunity to stand here in, in the closing plenary um, and speak to you. It's lovely to be in person. Um, it's been a long time. Um, I want to try and take a step back from the fine-grained empirical analyses that I've heard over the last two days and try to understand um, in this paper both where the effectiveness agenda has come from and how this history is now shaping where it might go in the future. Um, and I apologize, I will use the language of donors as northern donors and providers as um, southern cooperation providers, not the language of international development partners because I feel it sometimes obfuscates. So um, just keep that in mind as I, as I carry on. Hopefully this will work. So I want to start um, with a quotation. Um, this was said by the OECD Secretary General in 2011. It was actually tweeted out um, at the Busan Summit in 2011. The true achievement of Busan High Level Forum is the shift from talking about aid to talking about development. Um, the, it was quoted in a piece by um, Rosalind Iben and Laura Savage in an anthropological assessment of what transpired at the High Level Forum at Busan. And my starting point is this, that the shift from aid to development has not been a source of triumph for the effectiveness agenda, but a source of confusion. Um, and it has not helped the cause of development effectiveness. And so my key message is a transformational one. Um, this confusion, I think, stems from the fact that we have multiple narratives of development in circulation, um, but that we need to make sense of these narratives if we want a more robust focus on the how of development effectiveness. In other words, how it will be achieved. So the, the paper outline and the talk outline follows this structure. First is a literature review explaining why development effectiveness has underperformed. Um, I cite many of the people in this room to, to explain. Um, I then um, focus on three coexistent narratives of global development in a post-aid world. And here I zone in on the duty bearers and rights holders of effectiveness. And, um, and implicitly, I'm trying to look at how, uh, who holds accountability, who holds up obligations for accountability, and who holds the rights um, against them. And then lastly, I want to consider the implications for the next stage of the global effectiveness agenda. So if there are multiple development narratives circulating today, how far can this narrative pluralism be accommodated within the universal language of development effectiveness? And I basically argue that it has to be accommodated, otherwise we face another decade of decline for de development effectiveness. So first of all, why has development effectiveness underperformed? So I offer two explanations. This slide is focused on the first, essentially arguing that the principle of universality, and here I'm summing up uh, several literatures that argue the same, so it's not, not necessarily my unique original argument here, but that the, uh, the application of universalism and the desire for the universal applicability of development effectiveness norms, that they should apply to all parties, both in the global north and in the global south, um, was not fully accepted in Busan. And um, why has it not been accepted? It was sort of a source of some discussion in these literatures. Essentially, there was no acceptance of the equation or the equivalency of South-South cooperation and Northern ODA, as well as no equivalency between the idea of a Southern provider and a Northern donor. 
The north went into Busan, and I talk about blocks here, apologize. I know there were some differences, but the north broadly went into Busan thinking they would socialize the south um, into northern effectiveness norms and practices. Instead, the reverse happened as DAC donors downgraded their own commitments, creating a looser and more flexible international regime of effectiveness. And what resulted from that was a certain amount of differentiation because we could not get universal buy-in. Um, we had to essentially, um, well, the, the negotiators had to have opt-out clauses for emerging providers, which reduced incentives to comply with the impractiveness principles for all. So for example, a compromise stipulated that Southern providers could define at a later date their differential commitments to effectiveness, and they wouldn't be subject to monitoring. So where does responsibility for reverse socialization lie? Arguably, the donors who abandoned their ambitions to coax higher performance from the North, and they instead sought to reap the privileges of minimal monitoring and mutual prosperity as enjoyed by Southern providers, as well as perhaps the South clinging to identities as recipients, notwithstanding growing capacity and influence. And here I'd refer to some literature by Amrita Narlikar who talks about powerlessness um, as being a weaponized, the possibility for weaponizing powerlessness in international negotiations. And one might understand um, how that was the case in the context of Busan. A second explanation derives from this idea of multi-stakeholderism. And I think, Deb, in, a, in an earlier presentation this morning, you talked about um, a widening number of stakeholders in the ownership debate. Um, and that you couldn't fault donors for the, um, for the importance of this inclusivity. But one of the challenges of this inclusivity is it can widen agendas and interests and actually uh, not necessarily make better policy but enhance the legitimacy um, in this context of the effectiveness regime. And so the invitation of the private sector and civil society at Busan really there was a clash of views there, no agreement really on what the common meaning of development was meant to be. Um, and some suggest that a view of neoliberal capitalist growth, so Maudsley, Iben, Savage, and others, actually won out at Busan as it cl and clashed very heavily with civil society's vision of social justice. So, the narratives. So, I basically argue that we're living in a world where a north-south division of countries is delegitimized, where challenges are increasingly global, and where the territory of effectiveness had tethered itself to an expansive understanding of development. So all the narratives I present are really seeking to extricate development from a discredited ODA regime, pave the way for a different kind of relationship between low and high income countries, and steer a course, of, a course between the objectives of tackling um, global challenges in countries, um, so yeah, challenges within countries, and resolving broader transnational challenges. So just briefly on my methods. So I use this concept of narrative, um, narratives being a product of norms and identities, but operating largely at the level of stories where facts are shaped, acquire meaning, and relevance. They're largely heuristic devices and that can really help us frame how causal relationships are understood, which can then be the basis for taking certain policy choices forward. Narratives can coexist in conflict, and policy can draw on multiple narratives at the same time, even if there tend to be signature ideas in the policy space associated with narratives. Um, at any point in time, a narrative can become legitimate, acceptable, um, acquire a followership, um, so how did I arrive at these narratives? Essentially, I think it's been linked, my, my assessment of these narratives are linked to, more three more minutes, okay, so. Um, but the assessment of the narratives are that these are linked to the idea of development as a globalized intervention in terms of scale and scope. A strong amount, a strong literature um, commenting on the overlap between development and global challenges and global public goods in particular, and an ongoing analysis that we're doing at ODI on evolving donor strategies from the northern perspective. So I'm not gonna get a chance to go into them, but I'll briefly present them here. So the first narrative I talk about is a supranational narrative. Really, a, not, it's not really a new way to frame the purpose of development, but really much more visible in terms of the border trans transgressing nature of COVID and a warming climate. It's really given it renewed momentum. 
So here, the global challenge that we're tackling are global public goods, the modality through which are multilateral institutions. Um, the challenge of the institutions, however, is that they don't often offer a formal system of governance to robustly oversee GPG investment and accountability, although there are efforts in the policy space to uh, call for MDBs in particular to play more of a pivotal role in global good production. Finance through ODA and beyond ODA channels, the duty bearers oh, in this narrative are largely nation states. All nations have a responsible to provide um, global public goods and remove global public bads. And there is a sense that some states bear more responsibility than others, but that commitment is really contested. As you can see from the negotiations on loss and damage last week at COP27, country platforms are becoming one space where these contestations play out. Um, and you might want to look at the South African Just Energy Partnership as an example of that. But the rights holders here are citizens, and they're, all, they're global. They're meant to sit both in, in the North and in the South. Um, and the idea is that these voices can be represented and aggregated through global institutions, especially to police inputs, externalities, and consequences. But there is, a, there is a caveat here where partner countries seem to have fewer rights compared to donors if those global public goods are provided within the framework of a donor-recipient ODA regime. Um, so then I argue there's a nationalist narrative, and here the global challenge that we're tackling is the geopolitical one. So geopolitics is akin to a global challenge. Um, and you can think about that both in the context of Russia's invasion um, in the more immediate um, past, but also the rise of China and the role it started to play as a lender of first resort to the South. Um, the modality seems to be infrastructure schemes. Um, as the great game of the 21st century, the G7 partnership initiative, the Global Gateway, all but represent harder lines towards China, a framework for Western sustainability, good governance, and transparency. I'll just focus on the duty bearers, northern governments largely responsible for actually delivering on geopolitical security and growing national economic competitiveness. Um, and it might be hard, as again, some of my colleagues here at DIE have written, for the North to deliver on that promise. I'm not going to go into why right here. Um, but the rights holders here in this narrative seem to be the taxpayers in the North, um, underwriting this interest-driven development cooperation. Yep. So, okay, just quickly, I'll put the last slide up, is the solidaristic narrative, where we have um, global inequality being the challenge. Um, I argue global public investment is the modality here in the policy space. Um, and here, the idea is that nation states all equally bear duty. All will provide into a global fund. They will gain oversight, voice, and responsibility through that. And rights holders at the front lines um, who are in need will have a voice as well. So lastly, just the implications for development effectiveness, which is the key point. Um, the argument I'm trying to make in this paper is that development effectiveness needs to embrace stakeholder-specific accountability within each narrative to boost compliance with all the principles. The failures of Busan were ultimately about failing to ensure robust, sustainable accountability within a circumscribed development ende endeavor. Generalized monitoring, um, which is seen largely as the tool for mutual accountability, has just not been enough. So we really need to focus on who these duty bearers and rights holders are, and also think very carefully about the mechanisms for accountability within the narratives. We need to be aware of the narrative multiplicity and their orientations if we want a stronger political consensus. Um, it's only with that common understanding of what effectiveness is, how it will be delivered, and who should be accountable for delivering it that we might kind of make our baby steps towards some sort of consensus. And lastly, development effectiveness principles should strive for relevancy across all the narratives, just Thank as they you. strive across all sectors and all geographies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can see that I'm going to lose all my friends soon after this moderation because of the time reglementation which I'm trying to enforce. No, thank you very much, Nilima. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, the multiple narratives you have spoken about and uh, the di analytical distinctions which have been made between the duty bearers and the right bearers uh, at one point in time, and also subsequently the issue of the norms and identity, the other two categories which have been also identified for building this narrative uh, 
you know, the diversity. And why the aid effectiveness has underperformed, you have correctly, I don't know correctly, but I like it, the way you have pointed out that the, the principle of universality, uh, the principle of uh, the multi-stakeholderism, and also the third one, the the two reasons on that, uh, on that, and finally the three types of narratives. One is the supranational, the national, and the solidaristic over there. And you call for across the board application of accountability of the stakeholders and also the relevance for others. I think that was a very a fresh way of looking at the things that we are seeing over here, and I am thank you for making that presentation. So the third presentation which we have over here uh, is from uh, Professor Christoph Zürcher of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, University of Ottawa. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Professor Zürcher had a biking accident last week, and then a surgery was scheduled for today. So what we are going to do is to see his recorded presentation. We wish him early recovery, and let's enjoy the presentation. Please put it on. Hello, welcome. My name is Christoph Zürcher. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa. I am also the lead author of a recent systematic review on the impact of aid in highly fragile states, uh, specifically on Afghanistan, Mali, and South Sudan between 2008 and 2021. Now, I wish I could be with you at this really super interesting conference, but I can't. I uh, injured myself last week uh, mountain biking, so I can't travel. So I thought the second best thing I can do is to uh, record a, a very brief presentation of the main findings of that systematic review. Now, as you know, Afghanistan, Mali, and South Sudan are among the most um, fragile countries in, uh, in, in the world. They really need aid and they deserve aid. And they also got uh, help. The international community gave between 2008 and 2020 uh, more than 70 billion uh, OTA to these countries. So the question then is, and it's a very important, very salient question, to what extent can aid be effective in these contexts? To what extent can aid be effective in Afghanistan, Mali, South Sudan? And if it's not effective, what prevents aid from being effective? And are there still pockets of success? So to answer these questions, which we believe are really important, uh, we conducted a systematic review. And as you all know, systematic reviews are exercises in learning. Their objective is to identify and summarize all existing evidence on a given topic, in that case, aid effectiveness in the most fragile uh, countries. And Excuse me. And then to minimize bias, uh, systematic reviews rely on a predefined protocol that contains the search strategy and the set of criteria about which evaluation reports will be included or excluded from the review. So once we conducted our uh, search, we found 322 evaluation reports on Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Mali. Uh, they were published between 2008 and 2021 in English and for Mali in French. And we only included uh, evaluation reports that met a certain threshold, a certain quality threshold. So we defined two quality thresholds. We wanted to include both quantitative and qualitative studies, so we uh, defined a threshold for each type. One type we call rigorous study, that would be the quantitative statistical ones, and the other one would be the good enough studies, uh, which would be qualitative ones. So both, all studies had to meet uh, one of these two thresholds to be included. And we ended up with 322 studies, um, 148 on Afghanistan, 104 on Mali, and 169 on South Sudan for a total of 322. 
And in brackets, you see the number of the rigorous studies, that is of the quantitative statistical studies. So out of 322 studies in total, 83 were statistical studies, mainly in the sectors of health and nutrition. So what did, you, what did we find? Sorry, before I go to the findings, uh, one, one last remark. All of the 322 studies were then divided into 10 eight sectors, uh, stabilization, good governance, humanitarian assistance, women's rights, health, rural development, rule of law, education, sustainable economic development, and nutrition. Now I have highlighted stabilization and good governance, which includes here capacity building for government, because that is at the core of a fragile state. That is what makes it fragile, right? There's a lack of stability, there's, a, there's, there's violence, there's a lack of good governance, there's no capacity. So that is what needs to be fixed. That is at the core of what the international community hopes to achieve when it gives aid to Mali or Afghanistan or South, South Sudan. So we were obviously especially interested in aid effectiveness in these two sectors. And here are the findings, and unfortunately, they're unpleasant, uh, they're disappointing, but I do believe they are very, very important, and we have to take them into account. I do believe they are disruptive, disruptive in the way that once we have these findings, uh, it's hard to go back and continue to do things the way we have been doing things. So. Aid is not an effective tool for stabilization, meaning aid does not mitigate violence, it decrease violence or end violence. Aid is not a good tool for building capacities for the central government. These uh, initiatives were not effective. And aid does not foster better governance. So aid for democracy or the rule of law or the judicial sector, uh, financial transparency, all of these things did not really work. So. In a nutshell, then, aid was not really effective where it mattered most. Just as a quick reminder, these findings speak to the 30 or something countries that belong to the most fragile countries. Um, so Mali, South Sudan, Afghanistan, that's the country covered. But in, in the same group, there will be countries like the Congo, Syria, Yemen. So things may be different if a country is a little bit less fragile. So I plotted here as a thick black line, a sort of a threshold, a dividing line. If a country is below, it is really highly fragile. If a country is above that line, uh, which represents about the 30th percentile on the fragility spectrum, and then a country is only moderately fragile. So the black line is, is the Togos of the world, the Kenyans of this world. So maybe aid can be effective above that line. I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it's not effective below that line. And we have all the evidence to show it. So here's another way of depicting the findings, uh, as you can see. Aid were, was reasonably effective in sectors such as health, education, rural development. So sectors which could be summarized as uh, basic services or uh, coping mechanisms. But aid was not effective at all in sectors here at the bottom, governance, judicial reforms, democracy pro promotion and stabilization. So there, aid had no effect at all which is kind of an evil paradox because donors want to use aid precisely to change the things, to change the political economy of a fragile state, to build capacity in that state and to end violence in that state, right? They want aid specifically to address these things which are at the core of what uh, makes the state fragile. Yet it is these very same factors, the distinct political economy of a fragile state, the lack of capacity of the government, and the uh, persistent violence that makes aid ineffective in these countries. So that's the paradox where aid is, uh, is, is needed most, but matter most, aid is less, le uh, least effective. Uh, then there is this disruptive truth or disruptive evidence, what we find 
in all clarity in these in these uh, systematic reviews development aid may be may help to improve basic livelihoods basic livelihood service provision coping mechanisms right maybe to a limited extent and not very sustainable but it may have some impact in these sectors but it has no political transformative capacity in highly fragile states i call this disruptive because if that is true and i believe it is true based on the evidence then we really have to rethink our most basic approach to what we have been doing in uh, fragile states, highly fragile states. We have to very critically rethink the way we have spent $70 billion on Mali, South Sudan, and Afghanistan uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so. So I think that is, if we take this seriously, it is very disruptive. So what now? There's no silver bullet. In in these 322 evaluation reports, there 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 is no 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 silver bullet. They don't produce answers, right? We only can synthesize the evidence of what has not worked, but there's not necessarily an answer on what would have worked. Right? So the systematic review is only starting point. It doesn't doesn't provide solution, but it can, and should serve as should serve as a catalyst for honest discussion about a new aid strategy in fragile states. A strategy that takes its starting point in the acknowledgement that aid is not an effective tool for making a fragile state more stable, more capable, and better governed, which is obviously precisely what we have been thinking until now, and on what we have based our aid approaches over the last two decades or so. So if that systematic review has an effect, and do hope it has one, the effect should be, in my view, that it's a, it triggers that kind of discussion. And I see two very, very broad directions. One is learning, the other one is doing. So, so learning is, um, I do believe we need more evidence. We need to increase our evidence collection. I do believe there's tremendous value in, in doing such systematic reviews. We have done. Uh, we have covered three countries: Mali, South Sudan, Afghanistan. There's maybe 30 uh, very, very fragile countries. So we cover 10%. It would be nice to cover more. But we also need more evidence on aid effectiveness in those countries which are above that solid black line, which I plotted a couple of minutes ago. So. Uh, on the Togos, the Kenyas of, 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 of the world, to see to what extent aid is actually effective in these countries. So we need to figure out to what extent aid effectiveness is actually related to uh, this, the, the, the level of fragility. And one way of doing this is by conducting more systematic reviews. And that is why I would call uh, on the big players here, on, on the European Union, on the World Bank, on OECD tech, to actually invest in that evidence collection and to do more systematic reviews of uh, aid effectiveness in different contexts. That's the learning part. The doing part, it's very difficult, and I don't have any recipes, right? It's, 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 uh, I think we, we need to start from scratch and have a, a really, really open discussion. But there's one important lesson that emerges from uh, reviewing those 322 studies, and that is aid only has a fair chance of being effective in these contexts when programs are modest, when they're rather small, when they do not assume unrealistic partner capacities, when they are aware of the context, when they do not spend aid money too fast, when they do not spend aid money in regions which are still very insecure, maybe under the, the, the control uh, I will of have to request rebels. now to stop it because it's unfair to others, you know, in terms of time distribution. And uh, because uh, I cannot enforce my three minutes alert rule over here. Thank you very much. I think what we have heard is from Professor Zurker is an interesting paper which deals with 
systematic analysis of uh, more than 400 papers, uh, 322 in particular, of which he has taken out around 87. And you see if the number of papers which were larger in Afghanistan, but after the filtering, it is more in Mali. And wh what we have heard is that uh, the aid effectiveness as seen through stabilization and improved governance has not succeeded, but it may have some implication for the sectoral issues and judiciary health in particular, and may have those small gains and how do you take them in the future. And he ends up by, it, uh, he is talking about that uh, it, a learning um, implication and also a, a, a doing implication, a paradigmatic shift in terms of the, the aid effectiveness discourse, particularly for the fragile states. This is the second paper on the fragile state we have just heard in this last hour. And you will find some connections between the two and some also, I think, conflict between the two, what you have just heard. That may all come up as we discuss uh, the subject in the open floor. And uh, what is interesting is that um, the, there can be a counterfactual argument. The suppose that there no aid was given to either, any of these fragile countries, what would have been the situation? Would it have been a much more worse? Would it have been a spillover impact? So these are the, some of the issues we may discuss further as we proceed with the discussion. Now, let me bring Rachel. Dr. Rachel Kaleja is a senior research associate at Center for Global Development, uh, the UK. This is CGD, isn't it? In UK, in, uh, from Washington to UK. I'm from the London office. Uh, if I may brag, I'm a non-resident fellow of CGD. So it's a unique pleasure for me to introduce you over here. Uh, and uh, with the European Development Leadership Program. Uh, R Rachel is going to speak about uh, uh, the good for now, but not forever. Quite a forever. Officials perspective on the relevance of effectiveness agenda and the need for change. The floor is yours. Great, thank you, and thank you for that introduction, and a special thank you to the organizers. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next 12 minutes, I promise, um, sharing findings from a paper written with my co-author, Beata Chihotska, um, called Good for Now But Not Forever, Officials' Perspectives on the Relevance of the Effectiveness Agenda and the Need for Change. Okay. So this work was motivated by conversations um, that occurred during the 2020 Development Leaders Conference, which is an annual event that CGD organizes to bring together heads of development agencies for an open discussion about the challenges that they're facing. So during the 2020 conference, um, leaders expressed concern that the current effectiveness principles were no longer sufficient for covering the full range of modalities involved in development cooperation and that the changing purposes and roles of ODA were challenging traditional understandings about what makes ODA efficient and effective. So for us, these conversations really sparked three questions. First, how are the roles and purposes of ODA changing? Second, is the effectiveness agenda still relevant? And third, how should the agenda change to remain fit for purpose in an evolving development landscape? So to answer these questions, we launched um, two surveys with official, uh, officials from development agencies and partner countries. So our development agency survey reached a sample of 330 individuals from central policy and effectiveness units within more than 100 agencies across DAC members, non-DACs, DFIs, and multilaterals. Of these, we received 89 responses from individuals representing 48 unique agencies. Slightly more than half of our responses were from senior managers, and most were from people working in DAC member development agencies. For the partner survey, we approached 251 people responsible for managing ODA in 90 countries and received about 28 responses. Um, and these responses uh, and respondents represented 19 countries from across income groups and regions. So using the survey, we wanted to understand how the purposes of ODA, which we understand is the overarching goals of ODA, that ODA aims to achieve, were shifting alongside the changing landscape. So this chart shows responses to a question that asked participants to indicate how the prioritization of several key purposes of ODA have changed over the past decade. 
So respondents overwhelmingly suggested that tackling global challenges and supporting the development of the private sector have become increasingly important purposes of ODA for their organizations. And these purposes saw the largest increases in the partner survey also. Yet at the same time, respondents answered that the use of ODA to promote democracy and human rights and to alleviate poverty and human suffering saw the largest decreases in importance for their agencies. So this stands in contrast to the partner country survey, which showed that poverty reduction has increased in importance over the last decade. We also asked participants about how the role of ODA, so its uses as a type of finance, might be changing alongside shifting purposes and the new normal in the development landscape. Perhaps unsurprisingly, 85% of respondents suggested that the catalytic role of ODA was becoming increasingly important, while almost 40% said that the traditional role of ODA was in decline. In a separate question, we asked respondents how strongly they agreed with the statement that the main role of ODA is to catalyze other sources of finance. Here we found that while most providers agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, partner countries showed a much lower prioritization of this catalytic role of ODA. Okay, so far I've talked about how the purposes and roles of ODA are shifting. But for the remainder of the presentation, I want to speak about the implications of the changing development landscape for the future of the effectiveness agenda. When we asked participants whether they thought the Busan principles remained relevant for considering best practice in development effectiveness, 85% of development agency respondents and all partner country participants said yes, the agenda is still relevant. When we asked respondents to explain their answer, most agreed that the effectiveness principles are built on years of learning and experience and broadly continue to reflect best practice. However, when we asked respondents, um, oh, sorry, whether there was value in revising and renewing the development effectiveness agenda to account for changes to the roles and purposes of ODA, 75% of respondents from development agencies and all surveyed officials from partner countries again said yes. So if we take these responses together, what we're hearing is that while the effectiveness agenda remains relevant, there is demand for change. So when we asked respondents to explain why they thought the agenda needed to change, most suggested that revision was needed to overcome three main challenges. First, Many noted that revising the effectiveness agenda was needed to improve the technical applicability of the principles to changing contexts and modalities. Some argued that the implementation of the agenda was hindered by difficulties in applying the principles to newer cooperation modalities, such as blended or private finance, and in different country contexts, such as in fragile states and middle-income countries. Second, some suggested that the agenda needed revising to ensure that it remained strategically relevant and able to support effective action in a changing development paradigm. So respondents felt that the current effectiveness principles had emerged from a different era and questioned whether they were nimble enough to account for the uh, new development partnerships. From this perspective, the increasing importance of cross-border development challenges is viewed as necessitating a strategic rethink of what it means to be effective in the current landscape. And third, respondents suggested that renewing or revising the agenda was necessary to reignite political momentum for effectiveness. They noted that waning interest from political leaders had weakened the agenda's implementation and reduced the incentives for staff to prioritize implementing effectiveness commitments. Many also argued that the increasingly geostrategic nature of ODA and pressures to align spending with national interests had come to outweigh effectiveness, which was comparatively losing ground. And at the same time, Concern over limited political engagement from non-DAC providers, particularly from within the BRICS group, led some to suggest that renewing the agenda was needed to regenerate broad political interest, including from actors that had disengaged in the GPEDC process. So if respondents think that the agenda needs to change, then the question is how should it change? 
So we put this question to respondents and asked them to select all options that apply. Um, our results show that by and large, respondents think that new principles are needed to cover different types of development finance, to guide new roles of ODA uh, for different types of partnerships, and to define best practice on the changing purposes of ODA. So while we think this shows that respondents are looking for more guidance on how the principles can be applied in this new normal, the responses don't really show a clear direction of travel. So the question then is, where do we go from here? So based on the entirety of the survey responses, we propose a very basic and necessarily imperfect framework for thinking about possible options for the future of the effectiveness agenda, which we've organized around what we see as two key choices. So the first choice on the y-axis concerns the ambitiousness of the reform. So the question for us is whether there's political appetite to completely renew or rethink the agenda, or whether a modest revision is deemed more realistic. The second choice on the x-axis is about the breadth of the agenda in terms of the actors, modalities, and flows that it should cover. So across these simple dimensions, we identify four potential scenarios for the future of the effectiveness agenda. Our first scenario involves aligning the effectiveness agenda with the SDGs. So this is the most ambitious scenario and proposes rethinking the agenda to align principles with the spectrum of cooperation, partnerships, and actions needed to achieve the SDGs. So this scenario would require substantive political engagement to be successful, and some respondents thought that achieving this engagement might require transferring the governance of the effectiveness agenda to the UN system. The second scenario, three minutes, perfect, um, remains broad in terms of coverage, but would involve a modest revision or tweaking of the current effectiveness agenda. These revisions would focus on clarifying the ability of the Busan principles, uh, sorry, the applicability of the Busan principles to emerging challenges and different types of finance or partnership. However, such revisions would also need to focus on renewing buy-in from actors that were included in the Busan process but have since disengaged. The third scenario would keep the current effectiveness agenda as is, but would add parallel sets of principles to cover specific types of action. So an example could be new principles for climate finance. This option is already being used. Um, we do have the Kampala principles for effective private sector engagement, for instance. So the main revision here would be to add new sets of principles to meet emerging demands. Under this scenario, specific sub-principles could be targeted to and governed by the most affected groups. And then lastly, the fourth scenario would renew the effectiveness agenda, but narrow focus on the effectiveness of ODA. So this scenario considers ODA to be a limited and unique resource, and was raised by some respondents who said that they found the old ODA-focused agenda to be more useful. So the idea here is not to return to the 2005 Paris principles, but rather to rethink ODA effectiveness in light of the changing roles and purposes of ODA. So none of these options are perfect and each have their own costs and risks of failure. You know, on the one hand, ambitious renewals of the agenda could bring political momentum back to questions of effectiveness, yet risks diluting the agenda to achieve an inclusive consensus that might not materialize. And on the other, revising the agenda may address more technical concerns, but could do little to draw the political attention needed uh, for meaningful implementation. Um, how these trade-offs are balanced remains a very open question and certainly not one that we uh, propose to or claim to solve, but we hope that this analysis at least provides a starting place for thinking about the paths forward. Um, so I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. So that was Rachel, and uh, I also recognize her co-author, co Beata, over here. Uh, well done, and I think uh, it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, starting off with the three big questions, what is the role of ODA and the relevance of development effectiveness principle, and how do you make it more fit for purpose in the new circumstances? Uh, the interesting part of it was the survey. 
uh, one would really wonder why the uh, partner countries were less responsive to this kind of survey than the development partners, uh, you know, providers. That itself is a finding, I would think. Uh, the other finding in terms of that the better contribution of effectiveness uh, principles to, uh, you know, climate issues or to political or strategic point, that is also an interesting uh, summary which comes out. Uh, the, the, uh, the other perspective is, of course, on uh, how, how one moves forward in this. And uh, the three major points which came out was one is technical, one is the strategic, and then the political one. Uh, what is interesting is also that uh, uh, this, the quadrant which you have all saw, the fourth quadrant being the most ambitious one, and and the and the fourth uh, the first quadrant being the most ambitious one which is sdg oriented and the fourth quadrant which is the least ambitious one uh, which is possibly going back to the oda approach in 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 that way one would one would like to question whether each of these quadrant uh, spaces are mutually exclusive or not so because uh, in the sdg one may still account for maybe more flexibility ac ad accommodate the issues of uh, specific contextual uh, challenges and realities, if not in sectors. So but anyway, fantastic in uh, giving us the food for thought. And we have uh, hold, held back the best till the end, like a desert, as you know. So we have uh, with us uh, to present the paper, Andrea Vaccaro. Andrea, along with Rachel Giselquist uh, and Patricia Justino have re written a paper which talks about one of the most metaphysical approach of eight effectiveness indicators. So, uh, and we will hear about the empirical linkages between the principles and the outcomes. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. For and the, the time starts now. Introduction. <laughs> And uh, well, before uh, starting, let me uh, say that it has been a pleasure to meet you during these days, these two days of, of the conference, and uh, it has been enjoyable to interact with you and to exchange ideas on, on research on this important topic and hear about your research. So, um, do we have the uh, slide? Slides, perfect, thank you very much. The big green? Um, oh, this one, perfect, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's apparently not the case. Okay, so um, I'm presenting uh, here a paper, uh, the, our conference paper written uh, with uh, Rachel Gieselquist and Patricia Giustino uh, from UNU Wider, uh, entitled Indicators of Aid Effectiveness, Empirical Linkages Between Principles and Outcomes. So, uh, what is the uh, puzzle or the question that we are addressing in this paper? Well, as uh, we all know here, uh, these aid effectiveness principles emerged to support more effective development cooperation. So, of course, we would expect better performance in their implementation to be associated with better development outcomes. Nevertheless, there is poor empirical evidence to show that this is actually the case. So this is a puzzle, the question that we are addressing in our paper. And uh, we are addressing it uh, in two ways, so our, our paper has a twofold aim. Uh, first, we analyze the relationship between indicators of aid effectiveness principles, so aid effectiveness principles, and development outcomes. And we use indicators of aid effectiveness principles, so the GPDC monitoring data. We use indicators of economic and social development outcomes and we use indicators of institutional quality uh, to, to measure uh, institutional development outcomes. And then uh, our second aim is to evaluate the quality of, of uh, these aid effectiveness principles indicators, so the GPDC data. 
And, and so we contribute also to two different uh, strands of literature. Uh, the one that has analyzed the relationship between aid and development, or more precisely, the impact of aid on development outcomes, and also the uh, literature on uh, measures uh, and measurement in social sciences, so indicators of different relevant concepts in social sciences and their quality. So before uh, going uh, to, to, to results and findings, I will skip uh, some parts in this presentation. So for instance, the met methods parts and the literature part, but let's take a look at the GPDC monitoring indicators. Uh, so these are the 10 indicators that uh, represent the four uh, principles of aid effectiveness. So focus on results, ownership, uh, inclusive partnerships, and uh, transparency and accountability. So indicator one uh, measures focus on results. Indicator two and, th two and three, uh, inclusive partnerships. Indicators five, nine, and 10, ownership. And indicators four, six, seven, and eight uh, represent transparency and accountability. So, uh, before going to the actual results, let me say a few words on how we uh, arrived to, to this stage of the conference paper and, and, and to these results. So we started uh, with the research question that you saw in the beginning, and, and we collected data and we started analyzing this data, and we realized uh, while analyzing the data that actually there is no relationship, no empirical relationship between indicators of aid effectiveness principles and development outcomes. So this was quite puzzling, and we wanted to dig deeper into, into understanding why. So then we started analyzing the quality of uh, these monitoring indicators. And we analyzed content validity and data generation process. And we found out that uh, there are some shortcomings in these indicators. So first of all, these indicators tend to reflect formal implementation of the principles rather than actual progress in implementing these aid effectiveness principles. And then we also uh, noticed that some indicators, and in particular indicators of uh, the principle of ownership and indicators of focus on results, they overlap uh, among each other. So we could say that these indicators at least seemingly do not represent well uh, the implementation of aid effectiveness principles. Then when it comes to data generation process, we found, and data generation process means, uh, for instance, analyzing data sources, analyzing aggregation process, uh, coding procedures, um, analyzing the temporal and geographic coverage. So we found that there's quite a limited coverage both across countries and over time of these indicators. So we have only four uh, years of data, which clearly limits our possibility to, to analyze uh, long-term time trends, uh, but also uh, quite an important uh, number of missing data across countries in each year. Uh, then we have also some problematic coding procedures, uh, such, as, such as the fact that uh, different coders may have different uh, perceptions across countries on what they are evaluating, because uh, some of these indicators are based on survey data. So these surveys might be actually uh, incomparable or at least poorly comparable. Nevertheless, we analyzed the quality of the data and we moved uh, on to analyze again the relationship between uh, aid effectiveness principles and development outcomes uh, more comprehensively, uh, despite we knew that there are some shortcomings in the data. We used correlation analysis, so we analyzed bivariate correlations among uh, all different aid effectiveness principles and all the development outcomes uh, that you saw before, we found that the correlations are weak and non-statistically significant. 
Then we use descriptive time series analysis, so it shows countries that are actively reporting, so countries that have reported all indicators in all existing years of, of uh, these indicators. And we found out, first of all, that there's no consistent trend, uh, no consistent upward trend in these aid principles course of the actively reporting countries. We found out also that there's no systematic evidence in institutional quality in these actively reporting countries. And this is an important point because in this GPDC framework, uh, the, uh, one of the ideas is that countries who report actively their data should also increase their statistical capacity. Then we focused on economic growth and, and we uh, split the sample in countries that uh, have performed well uh, in, in implementing these principles and countries that have not performed well in implementing these principles and we analyzed whether there's a difference between these two samples of countries in terms of economic growth and we found out that there is no systematic, systematic difference. Then uh, we analyzed the data through factor analysis. So as you saw, uh, we have 10 indicators, but just four principles. So we aggregated the data at the principle level. We analyzed the correlations between principles, so aggregated data on each principles and development outcomes. And we found out that there is, again, no uh, correlation between uh, aid effectiveness principles and development outcomes. The factor analysis also uh, informs us statistically if uh, these uh, indicators of aid effectiveness principles reflect well uh, the, the actual four principles. And according uh, to the data, let's say statistically speaking, this is not the case. And finally, we analyzed case coverage because as said before, data missingness uh, was uh, an issue uh, in terms of data quality, we analyzed uh, how, how does the case coverage look like when compared to development outcomes. And we found out that data missingness is actually systematically related to development outcomes. And now if I have some time, I would like to show you a couple of uh, graphs from our paper. Uh, do I have still time to show this? Thank you very much. So first of all, um, in this uh, line chart, uh, you can see statistical capacity from 2010 to 2020 in actively reporting countries. And we would expect, of course, that statistical capacity would increase in these countries, since these countries are the ones that have actively reported uh, these, these indicators. But that's not the case. I have highlighted some countries with uh, these red boxes, and, and these are the countries, the three countries that actually have uh, had the, the highest decrease in statistical capacity. Uh, on average, um, there are some countries that, uh, in which statistical capacity has increased, but on average, uh, statistical capacity in these actively reporting countries has increased and more than in the uh, aid recipient countries that have not reported actively their data. Then another example from the paper. So uh, this figure shows the distribution of education in uh, all the indicators of aid effectiveness according to data missingness. So uh, the uh, red box plots show uh, the values of education for the countries that have reported the data for a given indicator. And the green boxes instead show the distribution of, of education in indicators uh, of aid effectiveness for the countries that have not reported their data. And we can see here that there is clearly a difference between these two, two groups of countries. Countries that have not reported actively their data have higher le levels of education. And this clearly affects our understanding of progress in implementation in aid effectiveness principles. 
So finally, to conclude, aid effectiveness principles are not systematically related to development outcomes. And one likely explanation uh, lies in the characteristics of the indicators of aid effectiveness principles. So in the current form, these indicators are important, but they provide an incomplete picture of progress in the implementation of aid effectiveness principles. And uh, as a uh, policy recommendation, we think that a revised version of these monitoring indicators, drawing on social science measurement criteria, would allow their use in more rigorous analysis and, and would be uh, useful for both uh, policymakers and researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and also Rachel and Patricia for that fantastic paper. As you all know, the monitoring framework or the monitoring uh, uh, f you know, mechanism of GPDC, I often call it the jewel in the crown. And Andrea, you and your colleagues have done extremely well in demolishing that jewel in the crown uh, on, on that. So um, uh, since I am a great uh, fan of that, let me put up a couple of issues over there. So the, we heard that uh, the study did not find any relationship, statistically valid relationship, between the implementation of the principles and the development outcome. Uh, the question is, of course, that uh, the, the implementation uh, uh, principles, uh, apart from the nature of the data collection, which you have rightly criticized, I cannot agree more on that, is essentially a perception survey. It is not really a measurable indicator in the sense empirically valid in that way. It's a perception survey. So to what extent one can relate a perception survey to an empirically or statistically estimated aggregate indicator? So relating and if these principles are in certain ways uh, could have been distinguished in terms of the nature of the country because the economic growth and poverty alleviation doesn't happen only because some aid has flown in into the country. So obviously, the level of external aid dependence and its implications are quite varied. So you, the, an aggregate level, you have done your factor analysis, correlation analysis, focus analysis, and the coverage analysis. But what would have been more useful if it was done based on aid dependence analysis? Then possibly we may have got some, and also the sectoral level on, on, on these cases. But to coming back, on, without going into it in f further, uh, what uh, would one would like to get into is that the 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 way it is the data is being covered uh, we we all know how it is being covered and important part of it is that the monitoring indicate the it is never really followed through the reform of the mechanism other than once looking into the indicator i have had the um, fortune or misfortune of being a member of the monitoring advisory committee where we looked into the indicators, but we could not really look into the paradigm of it, the structure of it. But your, sur your survey and your analysis now also points to the fact it is not only the indicators, but also how do you really align them and put them together and coverage and implementation is an important issue on that. Fantastic. This was not a criticism. A good paper always invokes uh, some kind of responses, and I couldn't control myself, notwithstanding me in the chair. Colleagues, may I now invite you to give a big hand to all the five presentations which we have heard today afternoon. <laughs> Excellent presentation and a fantastic, you know, the uh, closure session. And I have been keeping eye on all of you. All of you had been awake. So a big hand of applause for the participants who had been sitting in front of us today. <laughs> Very well done. Very well done. Uh, we started 20 minutes late. Uh, you had a very good lunch, so I di we didn't really disturb that time. So now we are going to take away 20 more minutes or 15 minutes at least for a good discussion, flow discussion, because this is the final session. We need to bring out some of core messages, what it is coming out. Uh, um, so I will not try to influence you with my opinion. I will open up the floor, and I would like to see hundreds of hands going up. So... 
Some of you can raise both hands. So I will start from there in the middle row. At the last, somebody raised hand. Yes. Please introduce yourself and give your question. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I'm Amita Voshwarkar from the Graduate Institute and Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. Uh, thanks to all the excellent presentations. I have a question uh, that I, uh, it's uh, for the entire panel. I mean, do you think that uh, we need to consider financialization as a conceptual category in today's aid discourse? And because, I mean, especially in health, be it Gavi Global Fund, Gavi's Global Act, uh, Alliance for Action Initiatives. So all their funding mechanisms are based on financialization. Financialization means in that way where we incorporate the financial act actors uh, in the systems, as well as its techniques and uh, tactics. Please keep it short. Huh? Yeah, so that's what, if this, this is conceptualized, then how, I mean, the methodologically, we re-envision the aid effectiveness, whereas the, because now World no, Bank No, no, because, has thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the question thank is you. taken. I, I think the colleagues have taken the questions. Who else is there? Uh, I will take towards the end first and then come back to the front. Yes, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Prime from the Australian National University. I'm from the Philippines. Um, since yesterday, we have used the term fragile states quite often, either as a panel titles or as paper titles themselves. But we are also aware that there are a number of scholarships that have argued that such labeling is not only detrimental to how we deliver international intervention, but also would be problematic as it fails to recognize the community's agency. So my question is like, Considering that this conference is a gathering of both scholars and practitioners, uh, any of the panelists would like to share what do you think is the implication of the use of these terms in the future of development cooperation? Thank you very much. I will not try to repeat what you have asked. I, since I may not have followed fully, I only leave it to my colleagues on my both sides. Yes, third. Next. Yes. Hi, uh, Daniel Esser from uh, IDOS, an American university. I wanted to ask um, anyone on the panel who wishes uh, to share an answer the following question. Uh, Nilima Gorajani said, and I quote, and I agree, building a political consensus around development effectiveness requires an awareness of narrative multiplicity and their orientations. And then Christoph Zürcher said that he hopes that their research triggers an honest discussion. I would love to hear from you, on a scale of zero to 10 towards having an honest discussion, where are we and why? What, uh, no, no, hold on, hold on. What do you think, where are we? <laughs> what do I no, think? where are we? Uh, between Please two and three, an two and three, three on good days. Huh? Between two and three. In a scale of five? Zero to 10. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, let's move on. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather. Thank you so much. This question is definitely inspired by Andrea's talk, although welcome others, which is, um, to what extent do you, what was your prior, I guess, really, on whether there was going to be a relationship between the aid effectiveness indicators and the development outcomes? I think that some of these, and I'll take ownership as an example, have intrinsic value, that it's about good process and being kind to another, one another's and national sovereignty and things that might matter in their own right. It's not actually clear to me if I was to draw a theory of change that I think the way, certainly the way the indicators are defined, that I would have expected a relationship. I'm curious if you did, and if you started to do any thinking about um, if they have these if indicators, if these principles are supposed to have instrumental and predictive value, what kind of indicators might we be thinking about instead? Does that make sense? Or do you want yeah, me to Yeah, predictive okay. value. <laughs> yes, thank you. My colleagues are taking copious notes. I'm sure they will respond to all those questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I was triggered what you said. I had the same question about the trust and the honesty. Because what I wanted to ask, the colleagues who were online are not on anymore, or are they? Because uh, when David Carment was speaking, uh, both, I was thinking uh, of... One of the speakers are definitely on the line. Okay. And the other one so, was recorded. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So I was thinking about Paul Collier, who was at the, at the World Bank session in a... What was it? A, sorry to my colleague, but it was a fragility forum in 2000. 18 or something, he said, we don't know what to do in fragile states, but we would do it anyway. 
And why I emphasize this is because what I wanted to ask um, um, Andrea and maybe um, your colleague, your, sorry, I lost your name, Rachel, I think. Rachel. Um, when you do this, um, um, I looked up the New Deal for Fragile States principles. It was agreed with the New Deal for Fragile States that that was a set of principles that it uh, uh, prepares the pathway towards a stage of those countries where effective development cooperation can be measured. So it was nowhere the what we know um, development effectiveness uh, criteria and monitoring indicators, but it was about um, legitimate politics, security, justice, uh, economic foundations, revenues and services. You know, it was a totally different. So what I wanted to ask, have you taken that into consideration? Because otherwise we yeah. are talking about apples and oranges. Mm. Because that takes a lot of time. And lastly, because um, what is in what is what? Pick your battles. The, um, I don't know if it is correct to make a cause and effect between a correlation between the um, effectiveness, development effectiveness principles and the actual outcomes yep. in, of development work. Yes. Because, first of all, development is development everywhere. Also in the Netherlands, I want to see my kid develop. So that does not have a pejorative connotation. Yep. Secondly, they are, I see them as qualitative indicators related to behavior of persons that work together or not work together. So I find it much more important or interesting to hear a research about what are incentives that make the principles work. Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense to change them. It will be still something that is people's work. And okay. very lastly, the social science measurement things. I was curious what criteria were you mentioning. The rest, rest is you. during the coffee break. Thank you very much. So who else is here on left side? There. I had only been a leftist, and, but I don't see any more hands on the left side. Um, hi, Gloria Novich, University of Ottawa. I had a question you were mentioning kind of is are the different possibilities around looking at um, shifting development effectiveness with SDGs, does it have to be either or agenda? I'm just wondering, if we keep on doing everything, when will we actually get to that more ambitious radical change? Because I think we've been patient for a very long time and we keep being told that we have to do everything at once and interestingly some priorities never really make it to the actual decision making table, which kind of brings me to the question of um, these indicators of development effectiveness, which then, again, it sounds like a lot of effort, time, and funding would be spent on figuring out how well we're doing, and then we're back in the same trap of everything is great and no one's happy. Um, so again, at which point do we sort of take the SDGs as imperative and trying to see what is effectively changing 60 years of these broken promises? You don't think that we can go step by step towards the topmost quadrant? I'm just building on the sort of historical analysis of the last 60 years and very similar promises of incremental change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who else is there? Oh, please. Thank you. This is very, uh, very insightful discussions. I just have a very short question. Do you think the GPEDC is still alive? Or what, what is your prospect for the future? What makes you think otherwise? <laughs> no, I am serious asking you. Why, why did this question come to your mind? Yeah, because I think that <laughs> related no, no, to that question. It's... Don't be shy, please. Yes, because I think there's not a genuine partnership there. I can see. Actually, actually, real talks are not happening. <laughs> you can see that I'm the only Chinese person here. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting. So I just want to ask that question. What is the prospects for this to, to go on? Thank you. No, that's a very uh, you know, fundamental question. And it was to be asked. Thank you for asking that. It helps. Um, uh, we uh, Please keep. Uh, mm, Please keep Professor Carmen on the screen. 
because he may like to respond to some of the issues which has been raised here. Anybody else? If not, please give a big hand to those who have given very good questions and have taken the, I think, uh, this, this Socratian method of asking questions takes the discourse a bit forward. It doesn't necessarily have to find an answer, that the question itself has an independent value, and I de definitely appreciate those who have put in the question. I have here four colleagues with me, and uh, I will let them be flexible and uh, opportunistic, whatever they want to respond to. Uh, and I will start with, an, uh, uh, on the reverse order. Professor, I will come to you last. Please be patient with us. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to respond. And thank you for the questions. Uh, excellent the issues, questions. So, uh, well, uh, I took some notes of, of uh, everything, so I, I will try to select uh, in, in three, minutes, three. Absolutely, I try to be even quicker. Thank you very much. So, uh, one question was on the future of fragility in development cooperation, and I think that is uh, very quickly a quick answer. That is the future uh, of, of uh, development cooperation, and, and something that we. Uh, should focus more and more on uh, development cooperation in fragile countries. Um, what was the uh, assumption on the relationship uh, between aid effectiveness principles and development outcomes before? Well, honestly, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it was... Uh, it was an, uh, an analysis to, to discover what's the relationship, right? And, and uh, we discovered, uh, personally, I thought that there would be something, but uh, that is, uh, at least with the data at hand, that is not uh, really the case. And uh, we, we analyzed the relationship between uh, one question was if we have taken into consideration that some countries, let's say the level of fragility or, or fragility uh, per se as, as a concept, and we analyzed the relationship between these principles and fragility, uh, the different um, dimensions of fragility, so authority, uh, capacity, uh, legitimacy. Uh, there was no uh, relationship, uh, at least between the implementation of the principles and, and these different dimensions of fragility. And when it comes to, to uh, basic uh, social science measurement uh, criteria, um, for instance, just uh, developing a clear framework where uh, the concepts are clear, where the indicators are clearly uh, reflecting or capturing these concepts, the choices, where the choices uh, are justified, so uh, it is clearly justified why this indicator has been chosen to represent uh, one, uh, one principle or another. Uh, as, as said in the presentation at the moment, for instance, indicators of focus uh, on results and ownership are uh, overlapping uh, conceptually uh, in, in terms of content of, of the indicators. And it's not clear uh, whether these indicators are actually measuring one principle, the other principle, or both. Um, so, so it would be important also to ensure that there is no overlap between, uh, between the, the data uh, in, in this sense. Um, I think I will uh, finish here and, and leave the floor to, to other responses. I'm pretty, sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure you will get more opportunities to respond to the others and the discourse will go on. It will not end today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna respond to two questions. The first of which I, I think is the one that was asked over here and which I think Dr. Bhattacharya had also asked, which is, um, you know, 
does it have to be either or on the scenarios? And I think, you know, we presented these as extreme examples um, just as an analytical exercise, but, but no, it doesn't have to be. You can pick and choose within that the, the you know, the, the variation that, that works best. And I do think what we've heard from conversations with people is actually perhaps an option in the middle might be realistic. Um, so I'll just, I'll pause there on that. The other question I wanted to engage with is, do you think the GPEDC is still alive? Because I think this is really important. Um, so I think, I mean, obviously, I, I want to be politically correct here, but I think we'll have a clearer idea after Geneva. Um, but I do think a, a key thing here is getting political support for the agenda, and that's something that I'll be looking for out of the Geneva Summit. Um, and right now, I don't see the political and high-level political support for the agenda. Um, Which agenda? For the effectiveness agenda. I mean, do we have a political Which champion? Which effectiveness we are talking about? Oh, I mean, the, the Busan principles or the, I guess, the, the upcoming, you know, the principles that we'd like to be discussing in Geneva and, and getting support for. Okay. Um, it's, it's at least the way that I see it. Um, and I do think that without a champion, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the agenda dies a little bit or the GPDC becomes more of a technical exercise than a political one. Um, and I think we did see a little bit of this in, in our survey. Um, we heard from officials that they, they really didn't feel that their leaders had given them the institutional or individual incentives to implement the effectiveness principles. And I think if you're, you know, the, these are the official, officials that are supposed to be doing this on the ground. So unless they're, they're incentivized to be doing it, then it's just not going to happen. Um, so I, that's, that's my two cents, I guess, in response to that question. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Um, I'm going to try and tackle the, the question about ranking um, the honest discussion, or the, the, whether we do have an honest discussion. Um, and I think I'd throw it back and ask, among who are we having this discussion? I so think. how do you define honesty here? Uh, that was the question. So, so I, how do, I, well, how do I define honesty? Yeah. Well, when I you guess. you say the honest discussion, <clears throat> you have to clarify the category first. Let's just say some of the inconsistencies and tensions and concerns that have been raised over the course of the last two days around some of the, the effectiveness principles. So I guess the question is among who are we talking about? I think there has been an honest conversation over the last two days, for example. I think the research community, to some degree, um, can keep policy makers honest. Um, and that long may that happen. Um, I'm not sure the, the level of honesty that we've seen over the last two days is something that we will see at the GPDC high level forum, but hopefully Andrea and Rachel and others, Deb, will, will you know, be, be there and be able to account uh, for some of that. But on the question of why, which I think is, is quite interesting, um, and again, I'm only, it's only conjecture, he, conjecture here on why, um, but I do think that the, the GPDC process kind of represents a bit of a, 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 one of the last forums for at least dialogue <laughs> across the north-south um, space. Um, the last couple of years, that dialogue has not even existed in many cases. So it may not be an honest dialogue, but it's a dialogue. Um, and so we need to <laughs> kind of embrace what we have, I think, rather than throwing it out um, entirely. But I also think from, from the context of, of, of the kind of the monitoring kind of system itself. I, I do think, you know, you, you showed quite clearly that um, it's not a robust monitoring system. Um, and I think the opt-out voluntary nature of it at Busan and what has led to just a, a, a general um, <laughs> a disregard on the part of the North for monitoring, uh, quite frankly. Um, and, and also really, you know, the opt-out clauses for the South as well. It's an entirely, it's a loose voluntary system. And I almost think it would be better to go back, not necessarily to the Paris principles, but to the monitoring focus of the Paris principles, which was very much on the North actually, and at least let's hold one side <laughs> accountable um, in a robust way, rather than trying to get everyone accountable, and then no one's accountable. So, yeah, that would be my answer to that question. I'm happy to talk about the others in Q&A, or in the talk or coffee break, sorry. Thank you. There is no dinner. You'll have to do it during the coffee break. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's have uh, the professor uh, on the screen, Professor Carmen. Yes, you may. Uh, I hope you have some chance to listen to what was going on in this room, 
and you may like to pick and choose and respond to some of the questions. Uh, I'm uh, on either on the fragile state issue or in general on the broader contours of the discourse, please. Well, uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I want to pick up on a couple of points. One is the, the question regarding fragile states uh, and the concept of fragile states. I think uh, the terminology fragile contact might be appropriate, but the basic point I would make here, and I think it relates back to this other question on trust and social context, is that all states are fragile. Uh, not just the cluster states that we typically rank as within the top 50. And I think the conditions in which they become fragile is as important as understanding that there are ways or avenues out of or exiting fragility. So let's let's keep in mind that under certain conditions, even the United States can be considered a fragile state, um, which is a country which is typically ranked high in a number of key indicators, including health delivery and so on. So once we begin to open up that envelope, we can examine why exactly these states become fragile. And I do agree that it's important to take it down a notch and look at the uh, local level or even the household level context. And of course, that's where we'll find a lot of important answers regarding how effective aid really is. Uh, on the question of social context, um, I think what was indirectly being applied here is the, the importance of trust, or what I call the social contract. And, uh, Although it wasn't really clearly made as clearly made in my presentation, I think the legitimacy component of uh, state fragility is under underemphasized. Quite frankly, donors don't know how to engage countries in a, in a discussion about improving legitimacy or what we would call the social context or uh, the social contract. And this is probably where we can find many countries falling back into what we call a, a legitimacy trap. Um, with respect to the honest discussion, well, if we're going to have an honest discussion, let's open up the so-called aid envelope and ask ourselves, are our other actions in regard to how we engage fragile states uh, detrimental to the progress that uh, these states are making or expected to make? Now, the moderator raised a very important point, which is with respect to the... Uh, the counterfactuals. And so a lot of this discussion is a little bit misplaced because we're only looking at the worst case scenarios. So uh, Professor Zucker's pr presentation focused on our, in our, in our evaluation, two countries that are considered trapped and one that has moved in and out of fragility, uh, namely Mali, which is probably now deepening its, its into a fragility trap. So when we select on the dependent variable, naturally we're going to come out with some bad news. But we also have to consider those states that have exited fragility. And one of the things, the challenges that we faced in writing our book is to provide that comparative context. So we have some way in which we can look, not at the counterfactual per se, but ask ourselves, how is it that certain states exit the fragility trap or exit fragility, which of which there are many examples, and I'm happy to talk about that, and against those that have not. And what we find then is that legitimacy to a large extent, as well as authority, inform those safe exits from fragility. It's not guaranteed and reversals are always possible. So I would I would suggest that we need to look at why those states, some, uh, cluster states remain trapped. And I tried to raise this at the end. I think geopolitics looms large in this discussion. Quite frankly, if we don't look at the implications of military uh, assistance to these countries in the context of aid effectiveness, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. Uh, significant portions of a uh, a country's budget is derived from uh, military aid, and as we know, that kind of aid is often fungible. It often doesn't go towards protecting uh, a state from uh, external threats, but rather is focused internally. And we can see what's unfolding uh, under these circumstances in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, which are experiencing significant declines in democratic accountability and good governance uh, with large-scale warfare. On, occurring in, in several instances in West Africa, the Sahel, and uh, Middle East, North Africa as well. So I think we need to be mindful. If we're going to have an honest discussion, we need to look at that larger envelope, um, notwithstanding the importance of indicators, but let's also be mindful of, of the problems of uh, results-based management in general. Countries will only respond to the kind of uh, expectations that are placed upon them, and they will find ways in which to mask uh, the real intentions of those who benefit from the particular projects that the, the northern countries are providing for them. So there has to be, I think, a, a way in which we can peel back the thin veneer of uh, 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 development uh, improvement over time and look at exactly how these countries are 
shaping their own discourse at the local okay. level. Yeah. Thank you very much. Colleagues, you have heard uh, the responses from our four out of the five speakers. Please give them a hand for listening to your questions so attentively. And what do you call? And responding to them honestly. Uh, thank you very much on that. Colleagues, I'm going to end now. Uh, the, the, so what do you really make out of this session and out of the conference in general? Uh, you know, my grandmother told me that never make more than three points. They will never remember the fourth one. So what are my three points for today's afternoon? The first and foremost point is that given the changing context and also in view of the experience, GPDC's you know, conceptual construct or the paradigmatic assumptions and the frameworks demands rethinking. This is very obvious from the one and a half day uh, the discourse which we have seen, that the world has changed, GPTC has to change too. And that will keep it relevant in certain ways. So the, we are talking about the framework, we are talking about the assumptions, we are talking about the variables and all those issues over there, both from the technical and political and institutional context is there. So this is my first takeaway from this conference. The second is that even if we get the paradigm Right. Even if you get a more updated framework, the interrelationship of the variables will still be important. So how do you really take an interrelationship discourse? The, the how does one influence the other or, the, or in a reverse way? Within certain specific contexts will be a matter for discourse for some time to come even after getting the framework uh, rejuvenated. The interrelationships will be an important thing. The causality issue is going to haunt us, so we'll have to find the correlation, or if not, the association at least. So that will be my second takeaway. The third issue is that even if we fix the paradigm, even if, or reinvent the paradigm, even if we redefine the relationship, we will still need empirical evidence to validate them. So the need for research, need for intellectual pursuit, and in specific circumstances will be equally important. So the, the, our exploration in terms of validity of the principles, the, the relationship or the causality runs which way, in what circumstances, and whether we have adequate information or data for them will be the third issue which is going to go, will stay with us for some time to come. So if these three things are, even if you are partly agreeable with, with these three points, new a rejuvenated framework, a better understood interrelationship, and a strengthened empirical basis, if it is there, then what is the prospect, what we see on, in these cases? We, have, we are standing on the, uh, in the, you know, on the wake of a very important uh, pos uh, possibility. The GPDC meeting, high-level meeting, is going to take place in Geneva next month. And this is an opportunity for all of us to make a progress in, in all these three fronts. Will there be a political incentive to do that? I'm not quite sure about that. But I am pretty sure that we need to carry on our efforts because in our, all our intentions, if you want a much more inclusive and a fairer world, I think we are in a common struggle over there. And that brought us all together in this town today and yesterday. And I, since it is the last, se last session of the conference, if, Rachel, if you allow me, I would want to thank the European Commission for supporting this great event. I want to thank UNU Wider for organizing it and giving us a fantastic hospitality. I want to give the thanks to the GPDC, the global partnership, also creating this opportunity for this discussion. And most of all, thank you all for your friendship and your companionship during the last one and a half day and safe travel back home. And thank you very much. See you again. Thank you.
microphone's on? Yes, thank you. So thank you, Deb. I think you were uh, perhaps a bit too quick, uh, a bit too efficient, if, if that is even possible. Uh, uh, but a few more minutes, uh, if you please, uh, so we will sort of close and end this conference sort of as it was, um, as it was intended. But uh, very nice words, uh, Deb. Um, we, uh, we appreciate um, you being so very active and also uh, caring. My name is Christina Etzel. I'm from uh, the European Commission. I'm the um, effect development effectiveness focal point in the DG INPA, International Partnerships, in the European Commission. I'm also here with some colleagues, so uh, fortunately uh, it's not only I um, who sort of shoulder this responsibility. But I wanted to, um, just before we close, also um, go back a little bit to uh, the introduction when we had uh, our colleague Fiona Ramsey um, share a few of her remarks in the opening address. She said, this conference is important, and that was yesterday. It feels like a longer time ago. Um, and I think we all agree, this conference has been extremely important. And uh, we still hope, we said so yesterday, but we hope that the findings and the results of the research that you guys online and in this conference room have done will also be carried forward. We have to do something with that. And that is, of course, um, I mean, it's, it's all of our responsibilities to think about that. How, how can we actually bring this discussion forward? It doesn't suffice with discussions, we also, have, we also have to act. So that is also bring, bringing um, um, uh, Gael, you mentioned the sort of the, um, uh, sort of the, um, what did you say, they call the sort of that the uh, policy and, uh, uh, policy and uh, action, there's, uh, there's sort of discrepancy and we have to sort of uh, narrow that gap. And how do we do that? Uh, well, uh, I mean, for once, you have a few civil servants in this room as well. You don't only have researchers, you also have civil servants. So you have um, made us come out of our offices and uh, take part of uh, your research. And it's also our responsibility, but also all of our responsibility to bring this forward. So it has been mentioned that next month, mid-December, we will, some of us, uh, quite a few actually, will go to Geneva and participate in the high-level meeting that the GPDC is organizing. And um, many issues will be discussed. And as we know, um, with these summits, many of these discussions have already started. Some of the documents are already ready. So, of course, one can honestly sort of ask oneself what, what impact can we have but I do hope, um, turning to you, Deb, that actually what happens in Geneva will have an impact as well. So when we leave Geneva and go into 2023, uh, we will sort of, you know, we hope that the GPEDC will put its ear to the ground and sort of hear what's cooking out, sort of out there. We know that context is extremely important. You've shown that in your research and context change. So, uh, it probably means or implies that the GPEDC should also listen to this and maybe change. I'm not sure how fast or how quick this will happen, but um, I mean, this is, this is what we've heard as well, that um, the question was asked, is the GPEDC relevant? Well, I think this is what, you know, we, this is what we have. So maybe we should stick to it, stick with the GPEDC and see if it can be sort of, you know, um, uh, be modernized. And um, last but not least, um, or second to last, so the European Commission, what, what can we do and what will we do? Well, we cannot uh, make promises you know, we cannot say that we, we will sort of change this and we will change that. We will be part of the summit. Um, the European Commission is a steering committee member. We will also take these discussions sort of in-house and see if there is anything we can do um, sort of to change things internally. Um, 
it, it sort of uh, comes at a very good time. It's an opportune time because also internally we're looking at, and, and that's probably sort of mirroring what's happening sort of out globally in the context. Things are changing, so the way we are working um, should pro probably uh, also be sort of um, uh, changed and up to date with uh, what's happening out in the world. But this is a process going on, so uh, I, we cannot say today how this will sort of, what it will look like in the future. And, um, and also the research, um, we hear that, I mean, there are still some question marks, uh, and, and maybe some more research needs to be done, and uh, in what areas, of course, all, all these questions or statements sort of followed by a question mark. But I'm just saying that from the, from, from the European Commission side, we'll also um, sort of reflect on this in-house and sort of see what can be sort of our role. Last now, uh, I just want to also thank uh, all of us, participants and uh, you know wider, of course, um, the technical uh, colleagues who've assisted with the sort of making uh, making it possible. We have had some hiccups with um, the people joining uh, online, but I do hope that the people uh, who've joined online have also appreciated the discussions as much as we have who've been sort of present physically at the Sheraton Hotel in uh, Brussels. And uh, also thanks to European co uh, Commission colleagues who have uh, really pitched in and uh, assisted in making also uh, the conference uh, a very good experience. We have things to learn, I am sure, but um, as we said, context ch contexts change and research needs to be sort of, we need to continue that. So uh, handing over to you, Rachel. Okay, good afternoon. So this has been really fun for me and I've really enjoyed uh, meeting many of you for the first time in person uh, and seeing some old friends and, and chatting over the past few days. Um, I think there are a number of really interesting and important findings that come out of your papers and have, that have come out of the discussions. Um, and I just wanted to very briefly touch on a few because I know I'm keeping you from sometimes flights and, and certainly coffee. Um, but one point I think is very clear that the effectiveness principles remain an important reference point, at least for the time being, for development discussions and development practice. Um, and I think this is underscored in Rachel's presentation, Rachel and Beata's study in the, in the, the closing plenary session. And this is in spite of the various concerns around the principles and the agenda. Uh, and in spite of what we've, we've heard about the waning enthusiasm for the agenda. Um, second, uh, I know that in hosting or coming up initially with the idea for this conference, the GPDC had particular interest in looking at the link between the effectiveness principles and development outcomes. So I think there was a question about what were your priors and why, basically why did you look at this? And so that was part of the, the thinking there. Um, so I would call this sort of building the, the why case or the business case for the principles. And I, you know, in spite of, of what we found in, in our work, I do think there is some evidence uh, through some of the studies that have been presented in this conference that speak to that in, a, in maybe a more positive light than, than what's suggested in, in our presentation. But at the same time, overall, um, and looking globally, uh, as we did in our work, uh, proving that there's this strong causal relationship between adherence to the effectiveness principles and development outcomes. You know, clearly there's some challenges with that. Um, and there might be a number of reasons for that. One of them is simply the quality of, of the data as they are now. Third, um, that said, I would submit that it doesn't seem so much to be that uh, this absence of a strong why case or a strong business case for the principles is, is the problem here, right? The problem in terms of uh, when we think about waning enthusiasm or uh, lack of adherence to the principles 
Um, there are a number of things going on, and Lima's presentation touched on that. But I think there are also a number, very clearly, a number of obstacles and contextual factors that influence um, how the effectiveness put, principles are put into practice. Um, there are certainly gaps, I think, as Deb's presentation, uh, Deb mentioned in his presentation this morning, in terms of guidance for the oper operationalization of the principles. Um, and so I, th I would say that this broad area is something where research uh, should be and I think is focusing uh, and is uh, a broad area where we should all be sort of wrestling and thinking and continuing discussions. Finally, it's very clear, it was certainly clear uh, in the presentations in the, this final closing session that the effectiveness of development cooperation in fragile uh, and conflicted affected states, fragile contexts, is a challenge. Um, some of the, the studies offered some ways forward. They offered sort of a, a more hopeful view, some less so. Uh, but certainly there's no, we, we don't have clear, we don't have very clear silver bullets here. There, This is something that needs continued wrestling in research and in, in practice. Uh, so we will be fleshing out these points and others as we work on uh, the very brief policy brief that we'll share with the summit uh, and the remarks that we'll share with the summit. And we will also be uh, sharing your papers, your background paper, your, your research papers that you have shared with us as background for the summit. And I think what we will probably do is link them through the, the web page. Uh, that we have. I know that some of you have asked for your papers not to be shared, and of course, if that's the case for you, we will not share your paper. And I know that some of you are still working uh, on further revisions, so if you would like to share a revised, a further revised version, please feel free to do that. Um, please don't share them after the, say, the 5th of December, uh, but we'll, we'll try to, we'll put them on, uh, in some way, linked to the web page, most likely. Um, so, by way of closing, final closing, I'd just like to thank first our partners, the GPDC and the European Commission, in, in, um, uh, who came up with the idea for the conference and have been just responsible for bringing all of us together. Uh, and I'd like to thank in particular Christina and Ida, who have been so closely involved with this throughout the, the last months. Um, and also uh, Nadia and MCI and, and their team for sort of making everything work. And I'd like to also just reiterate the thanks that Christina gave to, to others who've been involved in, in the process. I also want to thank our team on the UNU wider side. There are a number of people in Helsinki who were involved in making sure this could happen. Um, and I'd like to in particular thank three individuals. So first, Jutta Stenholm in our project support team, who couldn't come to Helsinki, uh, or sorry, who couldn't come to Brussels. She's in Helsinki, I hope she's online. Uh, but I think a number of you, I think everyone actually has been in touch with her about papers and, and PowerPoints and so on. Uh, I'd also like to thank Leni Varas, who is in the back of the room, and she has done so much to, to help us with the conference. Um, and I would mention in particular that she made sure that we had a very nice web page uh, for the conference uh, that we were not at one point sure would, would, we would be able to have. So that's been fantastic that she's been able to help us. And then finally, I'd like to thank Andrea Vaccaro, who has been the a tireless academic co-lead in the process. Um, and as you've seen, he's, I think, you know, he's been a great collaborator on the research side, but he's also been a really terrific project manager. And for academics, that's a very unusual combination. <laughs> so I think if you would please just give them a, a hand, a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, just thank you to all of you for joining us and doing great work and sharing your work with us. And. Uh, Please stay in touch and stay engaged and have a coffee. <laughs>